We want to continue our study in uh, the Lord's Prayer that we are reading in Matthew chapter 6. And I want to go back to that fifth uh, petition, forgive us our sins. See, two of the greatest, and it's very important that we really focus on this verse a little bit more because there's a, a few things we need to learn about forgiveness. You know, two of the greatest barriers in your life that keep you from really experiencing genuine peace of mind are guilt and resentment. Guilt and resentment can really mess you up spiritually in your life, in your relationships, in every aspect of your life. When you hurt God, <clears throat> that's really what sin is. When you hurt God and when you hurt other people, you often experience guilt. God doesn't want you to live with guilt. God is uh, doesn't want you to experience that and get bogged down with things like guilt. Guilt is a worthless, destructive emotion. None of us are faultless, right? We hurt other people uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, we uh, carry around guilt. We carry around regret. We carry uh, around remorse and shame. Guilt keeps us stuck in the past. It keeps us stuck in our problems. It keeps us stuck in our pain. It's an unconscious pressure oftentimes in our lives that robs us of joy and zaps us from that energy that God wants us to have. Uh, we may deny it. We may repress it. We may excuse it. We may rationalize it, but it's still there. And guilt destroys relationships your relationship with God, your relationship with other people. So the solution is found in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the solution is found in confession and repentance. And that's the focus of that fifth petition that we see in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts or sin as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we talked about it uh, extensively last week, or, or really it means forgive us our sin. And, and in many ways, this is a petition. We're asking God for cleansing, cleansing from things like guilt, the, the remnants of sin or the byproducts of sin in our lives that is unresolved through confession and repentance. So the fact is, we will hurt other people. Uh, we will also uh, be hurt ourselves, but we will also uh, be hurt by other people. And our response often is one of resentment. When we're hurt by other people, oftentimes, uh, you know, we may say we forgive them. We may say, you know, it's all right. It's, I'm, I'm easy with it. When in fact, uh, we're harboring resentment. Uh, and that is uh, seen in a desire to seek revenge. And sometimes we seek revenge in kind of hidden ways or not obvious ways when we talk about a person behind their back or, or we uh, shut them out of our lives in different ways. Uh, oftentimes those are just evidence of resentment, residual resentment in our lives. And that's what that fifth petition deals with. It's so important that we deal with these issues of resentment and revenge that God or Christ includes this petition in this short prayer on uh, this short prayer or this short, short uh, section of scripture that teaches us how to pray. And that's what uh, Christ is doing in the context of Matthew chapter six. Uh, this week, I want to again look at that fifth petition and uh, think about it in terms of a petition, not only of cleansing, but of release, release from resentment, release from guilt. So many of us deal or grapple with resentment because uh, we are going to be hurt by other people. It's just where it's going to be. We are going to be hurt by other people. And you may have been hurt in your past uh, by other people. You may be, uh, you will be hurt in the future by, un, uh, by other people. And sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it is intentional. So 
it's so important that we learn how to release that hurt or it's just going to pile up in our lives and hinder us in our growth as believers. Uh, if you don't learn how to deal with resentment and grudges and anger, they will build up and they will just poison your spirit and they will poison those relationships that you have with other people and especially your relationship with God. It's one thing to forgive a person who has hurt you one time. It, it seems to be easier, isn't it? Somebody's hurt you one time or, you know, it's just been unintentionally something and you uh, forgive them and, and you leave it at that. But the question is, how do you handle someone who hurts you again and again? Uh, what are you supposed to do with those kinds of people in your life, whether it's a, bo a boss, whether it's a spouse, whether it's children, whether, you know, whether it's a brother or sister in your family? How often am I supposed to forgive? Because I've been at, I've, I'm praying that I'm asking God, forgive me my sins in the same way I have forgiven other people. How often am I supposed to forgive someone who continually keeps on hurting me? And it's interesting to know that this is a question that Peter asks Jesus. And we read that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, we read this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Uh, we really don't know if Peter actually meant his own brothers or sisters, or he's referring to his uh, community of believers or, or, or whatever. But the truth is that 90% of all resentment really starts in the family, doesn't it? Most resentment is caused by people that we have some kind of close relationship with. Most resentment is caused by people who don't live up to our expectations in some way. And that includes your church family. Um, and sometimes, again, I know as a pastor, I unintentionally offend people and hurt people. And it's difficult, I know, for some people to sort of get over that and forgive me those things. So uh, how often should I forgive a person who continually hurts me and sins against me in some way? Uh, and the people, again, that often hurt us the most are those that are closest to us. And as I said, it's easier to forgive a one-time offense than it is to forgive a person who keeps on hurting you, especially if it's a family member who's causing you pain all the time. How often do I keep on forgiving my brother or sisters? And Peter says, seven times? You see, Peter thinks he's being magnanimous because the Jewish law required that you forgive a person three times. After three times, tough luck no forgiveness. Peter knows that the Jewish law says you've got to forgive three times. So he says, hey, you know, how about I double it and throw in one for uh, good measure, seven? That's a perfect number, Jesus. Uh, how about that? If I forgive a person seven times, am I okay? After that, game over, tough luck, no more forgiveness. But notice how Jesus answers. And most of you know how Jesus answered. Jesus answers not seven times, but 77 times. Well, what's he saying here? He's saying that our forgiveness must be unlimited. He's pointing out, if I'm counting, it's not really forgiveness. If I'm counting the number of times I have to forgive a person, I'm really not, you know, forgiving and forgetting. Uh, I'm not really putting it behind me. I, I'm keeping it right there as I count. So if I'm counting, I'm not really forgiving. So how is it possible for me 
to do what Jesus says here. Forgive somebody uh, unlimited times. How is it possible for me to have that kind of forgiveness in my life, especially when it's somebody I'm living with very close to, a spouse, a child, a friend, a family member? How do I keep forgiving that person who sins against me, who hurts me, whether intentional or unintentional? Well, to help us understand that, Jesus explains how it is possible. What what are the things we need to keep in mind as we uh, try to have that type of forgiving spirit that Jesus talks about here so that we can release the sin that other people have committed against us and release it just in the same way uh, we have been forgiven. So it starts, uh, he tells a parable. And the the parable is, again, familiar to most of you. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant. And it starts this way. Once there was a king who decided to collect all the debts that his servants owed him. So he began to call them in, in one at a time. And he asked them to repay. He discovered that one of his servants owed him 10,000 talents of money. How he got into that kind of debt, I have no idea. Of course, in in those days, they didn't uh, count debt or they didn't have dollars and cents or yens or, uh, you know, uh, yen or uh, any other type of currency, Bitcoin or anything of that nature. They were called talents. That was the currency, talents of gold. Uh, He was saying this one guy, Jesus is saying that this one guy owed 10,000 talents. And in today's money, that would be around $10 million. So the idea here, this guy is in deep trouble. He's in deep uh, debt. And the idea is that it's hopeless. There is no way he can pay that debt. And in those days, bankruptcy was quite simple. And it tells us in the next verse, since the servant did not have enough to pay his great debt, the king ordered him to be sold as a slave along with his wife and children and all that he had in order to repay the debt. Well, in those days, if you went into bankruptcy, the solution was quite simple. You were sold into slavery. We talked about that even last week. Or you're thrown into prison to force your family to pay. And if they couldn't pay, you could end up being sold into slavery. So this is an an impossible debt. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And he really needs a bailout. And the government isn't going to bail him out or no one else is going to bail out. He's stuck. So he only has one course of action. And the next verse says the, the servant fell to his knees, and he begged the king, please, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay you back everything I owe. Well, verse 27 tells us the king was moved with compassion, and he released him. So he released him from his debt. He released him and forgave him, canceling his entire debt. The king has compassion. He feels sorry for this person. And he actually, he knows he can't pay the debt. It's impossible. So he actually releases him from that debt. It's written off. He's got a clean slate and uh, no more debt. He's in great shape. Now, think about yourself. What would you do if someone forgave a debt of that magnitude in your life? uh, what what would you do if somebody let you off the hook? You know, more important, why uh, must you do it? Why must you let people off the hook uh, who have hurt you deeply and badly when everything in you wants to hold on to that hurt and make them pay? God's word gives us many reasons. We... Uh, why we should let go and release a person 
and release uh, that uh, release ourselves from that sin of another person. Uh, the gospel gives us many reasons why we have to stop rehearsing the hurt and release the hurt uh, of that of a person who has sinned against us. So this story tells us, and Jesus gives us many reasons here. And uh, next week, I want to look at a couple more reasons that are found here for get for uh, for uh, for the reason the reason why we should forgive. And the main reason is because God forgives us, and that's the main point of this parable. In this story, Jesus tells us the king, who obviously represents God, forgives the servant. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 27 says this, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go, as we read earlier. And just as the king canceled the debt of his, this servant in this story, God sent Jesus Christ to pay our debt. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that all have sinned. We're all in debt to God. And that the wages of sin is death, separation from God, a place the Bible talks about as hell, uh, separation from God, a place where we are going to be tortured in ways I, I can't even imagine because we are separated from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So God offers us a pardon. God offers us a gift that we need to accept, and that gift is made possible by Jesus Christ. You know, the reality of it is I can't even comprehend my debt to God. I can't comprehend the number of ways I have hurt God by rejecting him and rejecting his word. It's incomprehensible. I sin by commission. I sin by omission. There are things I sin in ways I haven't got a clue uh, that are really sin in my life. The debt is incomprehensible. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal it to me. And that's what Jesus teaches us as he's leaving his disciples, that the Holy Spirit will come and convict us of sin and judgment and righteousness. So it's only the Holy Spirit of God. We need to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, listening to the Holy Spirit. It's only the Holy Spirit that can re reveal the depth of God's love and forgiveness that I can attain through faith in Jesus Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal that truth to me. The fact is, as I've said, we owe God an enormous debt, a debt that we could never repay. And God, in his mercy, has chosen to wipe that debt out. God has chosen to accept the death of Jesus Christ as payment for our debt. God has chosen to accept my faith in the death of Jesus Christ, in the work of Jesus Christ, as payment <clears throat> for the debt that I owe him. Now, let's get back to this. Let me ask you this. How would you respond if someone paid off a debt of this magnitude that is described <clears throat> in this parable? Uh, how would you feel if someone after you had just bought your first home and you got this mortgage that you're saying, I don't know how we're going to pay it. In fact, when we bought our first home, when we lived in Kingston, uh, Jane was working for Christian, uh, Christian, uh, Christian Horizons, and I was working for the church, and uh, we just scraped enough money together to get a more, uh, to buy a house. We bought a house, and I think the week we bought it, Jane said, you know, I'm quitting my job, and I want to go into teaching. Well, you know, I would have jumped for joy if someone had to come along and said, you know, Dana, don't worry about your debt. Don't worry about your mortgage. We'll pay your mortgage right off. You're free. You're released from the debt of that mortgage. Or let's say you had a car loan and you just bought this car and, and someone came up to you and said, guess what? 
I'm going to pay that pay for that car. I'm going to release you from that debt, from that loan that you've taken on. It would be something that would, what a, what a release, what a, a relief. You'd yeah, be jumping for joy. Uh, you would feel nothing but gratitude. And I think you'd want to pay it ahead. I think you'd want to say, you know, that person has been so gracious to me. I want to pay it ahead. You know, when I was, I left home when I was 17. And, you know, uh, a number of people welcomed me into their home. And I just became part of their families. Uh, these were Christian families, people that knew Christ as, as Lord and Savior, and they welcomed me into their home. You know, I can't tell you what a difference that made in my life. It just took away the anxiety that I had as a 17-year-old who didn't have a clue, didn't have a penny, whose family was now living in Ottawa and I was living in Barrie. I mean, I was on my own, but these families <clears throat> brought me into their homes, allowed me to stay in their homes rent-free. And this took place for you know years until I got my life together and I was able to go off to school and then uh, get into the ministry and, and, and support myself. Well, you know, Jane and I, almost from the beginning of our marriage, have welcomed people into our home. I don't know if there has been more than a few years that we haven't had someone living in our home uh, rent-free to help them over a <clears throat> difficult period in their time. I'm thinking of one gal who came from South Africa to Saskatchewan and just was devastated as she was dealing with loneliness and dealing with uh, just the shock of being coming from South Africa to, you know, Melford, Saskatchewan and the cold. And uh, we welcomed her into our home. We said, why don't you stay with us? Why don't you stay with us? And she stayed with us for a couple of years. And then we had another guy who had just graduated Bible college and he was grappling with trying to get his life and we had him stay and then after that we had another friend uh, a, a, a gal stay with us who was you know again trying to get her life together and and the list goes on I can tell you a, of many many people over the years that have stayed with us why was I doing that why why would I open my home to having these people well I felt a debt of gratitude I wanted to pay it forward. It had meant so much to me when I was 17 years old that someone had released me from the burden of trying to make it in this world and finding a place to live and given me a secure place to live. And I wanted to pay it forward. That was, I think, well, that was my response to somebody who had come along and, and, and helped me in such a significant way. But as we know in this story, <clears throat> this servant had a, a, a different reaction. In fact, what he does uh, uh, right off the bat, just after he's left the king's present, he finds a guy that owes him just a few bucks, a little bit of money. Uh, basically, it was, it was nothing. And he begins to threaten the guy. And he says, you better pay me back or I'm going to throw you and your family into jail. That's what the story goes on to say. And it's interesting. This guy, although he'd been forgiven $12 million, he'd been forgiven a $12 million debt, he showed no mercy to a guy who owed him the equivalent, the equivalent of 17 bucks. And we know that he grabs this guy and he starts choking him. And in Roman law, in the Roman Empire, you were allowed to choke a debtor. I guess you're trying to choke it out of him. I don't know why they would allow that. But that's what we read about in, in the Roman Empire way back then. Now, why was this guy so harsh? I, you know, we can think of a lot of reasons. Ingratitude. Yeah, that guy owed me it anyhow. Uh, maybe he didn't understand the magnitude of his debt. Yeah, you know, okay, hey, I pulled one over on the king. It's no big deal. 
uh, you know, didn't understand how great this debt was. Maybe he fe felt that, hey, you know, I, I don't feel forgiven. I feel I still owe the king a debt. So I'm going to start collecting money just in case the king comes back and, and changes his mind. You know, I think the point here, one of the points here is when I feel unforgiven, I'm not forgiving. When I feel unforgiven, I'm unforgiving. It means I really don't understand the gospel. I don't really understand the magnitude of my debt to God. Uh, it means I don't really understand that I have been saved by grace. And maybe it means I still believe in salvation by works. I'm going to try to pay God back, which is just ridiculous when you think of the magnitude of our debt. See, the most forgiving people in the world are those who feel the most forgiven. The, the most forgiving people in the world are those who understand how much they have been forgiven. I think that comes clear in this parable. If I am dealing with resentment, a lot of us are. If I'm dealing with an unforgiving heart, you know, that person hurt me and I just cannot forgive them. And maybe you're having a hard time, you know, uh, forgiving or you, you, you feel God has done you wrong. And, and you know, he's, he's not given you or taken away something from you or given you something or you're dealing with a sickness and, and you feel, no, God, you, you've done me wrong. I can't forgive you for what you have done. See, I think the only solution to that is I have to return to God and I have to return to, God, to the gospel. I need to pray that God will allow the Holy Spirit to reveal my debt of sin and the hurt that I have caused God. I really need to feel, I really, really need to understand how much uh, in debt I am to God. I need to understand who God is and his grace. I need to pray that God will allow the Holy Spirit who has been come to teach me about sin and judgment uh, and, and teach me about salvation. I need to pray that God will allow the Holy Spirit to show me how that debt has condemned me, has imprisoned me, and how hopeless my situation is without Christ, without the sacrifice of Christ and the spiritual gifts that are possible through Christ. I need to pray to God that he will allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the depth, the width, the length of his love and forgiveness for me that I attain through faith in Jesus Christ. Again, the most forgiving people are those who know and feel how much they have been forgiven. Let's just pray, Lord, show us the debt of our sin. Show us the, the height, the breadth, the, the depth of your love and how much you have forgiven us. Lord, help us to respond to those who have hurt us with, with a forgiving spirit because we know how much we have been forgiven. We pray these in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you this week.